Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 179 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. One thing that tends to get lost in the mud and blood filters of battle-focused modern medieval content is the lushness of the medieval landscape. With fewer people on Earth, most of them involved in agricultural work, the Middle Ages was a time in which people were closely tied to the plants in their environment, deeply aware of their potential as sources of food, healing, and beauty. In the medieval world, Islamic gardens were the envy of many a realm, incorporating the sensory beauty of the natural world with creative technological and mechanical innovations. This week, I spoke with Dr. D. Fairchild Ruggles about Islamic gardens in the medieval world. Didi is a professor and the Deborah L. Mitchell Chair in Landscape History at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She is the author of many books, including Gardens, Landscape, and Vision in the Palaces of Islamic Spain, Women, Patronage, and Self-Representation in Islamic Societies, and Islamic Art and Visual Culture, an Anthology of Sources. Today, we'll be digging into her book, Islamic Gardens and Landscapes, the winner of the J.B. Jackson Book Prize from the Foundation for Landscape Studies. Our conversation on Islamic gardens, their cultural significance, and the ingenious ways in which they were cultivated is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Didi, for joining me to talk about Islamic gardens. I really enjoyed your book, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. I am, too. I'm hoping it's going to be as fun for you as it is for me. (laughs) So one of the things I wanted to start with is that you are talking about Islamic gardens. You've been talking about them for your career. And one of the things that you mentioned at the beginning of the book is a distinction between using the term Islamic and using the term Muslim. So how are you using these terms in your work when you're talking about gardens and landscapes? You know, to some degree, it's an artificial distinction. But for the sake of making a distinction between religion and culture, A lot of us will use Muslim to refer to the people who practice the Islamic religion and Islamic for all of those other cultural practices that people may engage in without necessarily subscribing to the religion. You know, arts production, whether you're living in an Islamic kingdom as a Muslim or living there as a Christian, and there were plenty of situations like that, you might be producing work that looked pretty much the same, what we would say looks Islamic. Some people make an extra distinction and they call something like that Islamic Kate, meaning, you know, Mm Islamic-ish. This is important because the Muslim religion expands across a huge geographical area. And when you have people who are Muslim in power, it doesn't mean that everybody who is under that power is actually practicing, right? And they're taking on all these aesthetics, like you're saying, right? So it's important to make these distinctions. It is. And it's one of the signal characteristics of early Islamic civilization, maybe maybe still, but you know, I'm a medievalist, so I can speak to that period, which is that there is a formal doctrine of tolerance, of religious tolerance. It doesn't mean that you're an equal citizen, yeah. but you do have the right to practice your religion and to exist and to, to follow some of your own religious laws, you know, particularly regarding family life. So we do have large populations of Christians and especially Jews living under Muslim rule in part because it could be pretty bad for Jews in Europe. And it was marginally better under the Islamic sultanates. Exactly. So when we're talking about your work, taking into account Islamic gardens and landscapes, we're talking about, I already mentioned, a really big geographic area. Can you give us an idea of what your work covers when you're talking about this style of garden in the medieval period? I mean, I, I study all Islamic gardens right up to the 21st century, but <laughs> but my real interest is in a kind of formative period that happens in the first four or five, maybe six centuries of Islam, where we have a political expansion and therefore a cultural expansion, such that we come to a moment where there are Muslims living in China, there are Muslims living in Southeast Asia, in South Asia and all the way across to Spain and Morocco. And that's a very, very large area of the world. But it's mostly collected around one kind of belt that goes east to west. It's not a big spread north-south, but east-west, it's a pretty big belt that is characterized by Islamic civilization. And so that actually makes it very easy for plants to travel because they're traveling from climates that are fairly similar, not entirely similar, but fairly similar. And it makes it much easier to domesticate a plant that comes from maybe dry land in Turkey 
into dry land in Spain or Morocco. And that's exactly what happened. We have this westward shift of plants. The actual techniques and practices of agriculture, of course, really don't rely very much on culture. They rely on, you know, a very fine set of survival skills that farmers hand on one generation to the next, regardless of what God they believe in or what political body is governing over them. So there's, in the best of times, there's continuity. And that means that when new plants arrive, you have this kind of continuous tradition that somehow adjusts itself to make room for these new plants. And of course, that in turn causes a demand for new techniques and new ways of handling new plants, by which I mean irrigation, new ways of fertilizing, new ways of propagating plants, new ways of transmitting information about new and unusual plants. There's a lot of this happening in the Islamic world, particularly in the sort of the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, 12th centuries as being a real active period of plant exchange. Some people even call it an agricultural revolution. That might be putting it in too dramatic a light, but it certainly was a, a period of great change. Yeah, I think that is definitely safe to say, especially when you look at the sites where there were big gardens or there was a lot of irrigation happening. Now, it's not like that anymore. And so there must have been a shift towards irrigation and then from it again. So I do want to get into irrigation in a second. But we were talking about some of the ways in which aesthetics can cross over from one religion to the other, from one culture to the other. Let's start with religion for a second, because I think when people talk about Islamic gardens, they think that from the beginning, they have a religious significance. That is the reason behind the gardens. And that is something that you kind of push back against in your work. So tell us about how religion plays with gardens and whether that was always the case. It's complicated because obviously to garden is a very religious act, right? It is an expression of your place on earth which is performed by the act of gardening and tending the land that you live on. So yeah, to some extent, there is a, a strong religious motivation or, or expression that happens when one gardens. But I actually am much more concerned with that continuity, that handing over of a very ordinary technique. I mean, to dig a hole and plant a seed is not rocket science. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not complicated, but it's complicated only in the how should we say it, the collective kind of fabric that includes technologies and new plants and new ways of doing things that is usually fairly slow to change. And that happens regardless of one's cultural context or one's religious beliefs. I mean, if you need a good crop, you're just going to do whatever it takes to get that crop. I mean, and you're also going to pray, right? Because there's a certain degree, certain extent to which whether the crop succeeds or fails is out of your hands. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you pray because, <laughs> I mean, we all do, right? There's that moment when it's out of my hands, just pray, hope that it all works out. But what's happened in the way that historians have thought about Islamic gardens is they kind of glom on to the four-part garden, you know, the garden divided into four quarters, which is called the Chaharbagh or the Charbagh, depending on what part of the world you're in. And unfortunately, there are very few of those kinds of gardens that were ever built. And they were mostly built for very elite contexts and usually built for palaces. So to say that they have some deep religious meaning reflecting what people say is that it reflects the four rivers of paradise that are described in multiple verses in the Quran. And the truth is, yes, there is a corollary. There is a parallel between these. But there were far more gardens that did not have four rivers running through them and far more gardens that did not have that cross-axial layout. And they're gardens. They're not just fields. They're gardens that have a kind of aesthetic, cultivated, intense expression that they are asked to perform. So the question then becomes, well, if it's not a four-part garden that gets its meaning from the Quran, what do these gardens mean? Where do they get their form? Do you want the answer? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> Yay. of course we do. <laughs> the answer is it comes directly from agriculture and the need to organize the earth. So if you're a farmer and you need to irrigate your land, and that would be the land usually not way far away from a city that tends to be dry, dry land farming, but any irrigated farming, which would be any vegetable, not wheat, 
probably not olive trees. Olives need a little bit of water, but only at the very beginning to get them going. But all the vegetables, right? Any radishes, scallions, you name it, all that stuff needs irrigation. And the question is, how do you get the irrigation? How do you get the irrigation from the source, which might be underground, it might be a river, it might be a cistern, water that's been dammed somewhere, to your field? Well, that requires digging a channel. Once you get the water through the channel to your field, how do you get it to the various plots within your larger field? And that's where the dividing up of the earth happens. And then people look at that and they say, oh, Chaharbag again, four-part garden. But in fact, these are not four-part gardens. They are sort of rectilinear, they're geometrical, but the geometry springs from a need to organize and distribute water not from some deeply philosophical or deeply held belief in the Quran. I think what happens is the Quranic understanding of the perfect place, which is paradise, gets added to the garden. Because the garden is, of course, perfection, right? The field is where you just make it all happen. But the garden is where you really make it look wonderful. It's where you have your tastiest fruit and your most exotic plants are all collected into the garden. The garden is that kind of intense expression of everything that's already happening out in the larger landscape. So it is a, an intense expression. It is meant to suggest something more than itself. But we have a choice. One is, does it suggest something more than itself, meaning in a religious sense, paradise, or does it suggest something more than itself, meaning the larger landscape? and all the mechanisms that are at play there in order to make it productive. I'm not sure there's one explanation, by the way. I just think that we have overemphasized the religious one and forgotten about this other very important one, which, by the way, is also driven by a religious precept. And the religious precept is that human beings are put on the earth to take care of it and make it grow. That's a mandate that comes from God. Christians will recognize that. Muslims will recognize that. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say that I think these things can always exist simultaneously <laughs> throughout that time. It always depends on how you read it. And one of the things that you do in the book is look at the garden and all of its signifiers. What are the signs within the garden? And these are read differently by who is in the garden, right? Yes. I'm not sure that people were always aware that they were looking at something symbolic, but there is, for example, this, an awful lot of gardens will have a fountain in them. And fountains are very nice, but you don't really need them in order to introduce <laughs> water, right? You can bring that ditch that carries water on the surface of the ground and it will introduce the water very nicely. What the fountain does is it takes that moment of water's entry into the garden or what, or the garden space, because it might be, it might even be a park, it might be larger. It takes that moment of introduction and it turns it into something noticeable, something expressive, something that we pay attention to. It turns an ordinary technique into something that we would call symbolic, right? Symbolic of something larger than itself, which is how water reaches the earth. Mm -hmm. And fountains are not the only way that this happens. I mean, we find this also with pavilions in the garden. You know, why do we have pavilions? Well, of course, practically, it's place to avoid the sun. But it's also symbolically this thing that marks human presence, the place where we sit. You know, where is our place in the garden? Our place in the garden is in the pavilion, looking around us, appreciating nature that has been carefully produced for us, somewhat artificially. Mm -hmm. It's one of these things where you build it and then it becomes symbolic or it's symbolic and then you build it. These things can work together, right? My mm -hmm. last book that I wrote was about monks and there is a lot of philosophical thinking about fountains when it comes to monks as well. This, they symbolize the Trinity, which is not something that Muslim populations are going to be thinking about, but the same symbol can mean different things to different people. How It depends on how you're reading it, right? And really good symbols tend to be kind of sticky in that they acquire new meaning right? They, they get meaning because it seems to suggest an idea to people. And I think this is exactly what's happened with the garden and, and fountains. This yeah. you know, attraction of, of new layers of meaning that get added to it. Well, water is so important. And I think it's 
it becomes especially important in in a lot of ways symbolic. I think because a lot of the places where these gardens are springing up are in very arid environments. For example, Islam is born in the Middle East, where it's very dry a lot of the time. You listed some of the ways in which people irrigated their crops, but. Can you get into it a little bit more and tell us the techniques? Because I think they're fascinating—the different ways that people irrigated at this time. Yeah, I'm fascinated by irrigation. It's like if I could describe myself, I would say I'm a scholar of irrigation history. <laughs> but no one would ever hire such a person, so one has to make it broader and say it's really landscape history. This but is your moment, <laughs> <laughs> right? I irrigation is the key to these landscapes, though. And so I'm trained as an art historian and. Art historians, of course, we look at a whole range of things, but one of the things we pay careful attention to is representation. But really, in my work, I started paying a lot of attention to technology, how to make things happen, because that's also symbolic, right? It's a kind of performance of human ingenuity, of human know-how, right? The ability to transform the earth is an amazing thing, particularly in the medieval world, where transforming the earth you know, means you have surpluses and surpluses mean you have more food in the markets and you're making a profit and you're you're reinvesting it back into your country villa and into your palace. And, you know, everything gets more beautiful. It also gets cleaner because they build sewers and they build clean water cisterns. All of this is very positive and it's very much linked to the management of the land. Irrigation, you know, we talk about it as just happening, but I live in a part of the world where irrigation does fall from the sky. It really does just happen. But in those parts of the world that are naturally arid, usually we say there's no water, but in fact, there's, there's always water. If there are people there, there's water. It's a question of where does it come from? And if it's coming, for example, in Egypt, if it's coming from the Nile, then one gets very used to the idea, this was before they built the, the Great Dam, gets very used to the idea of an annual inundation, such that the Nile overflows its banks, the water is held back, it's actually dammed, and barriers are put in place to keep the water as long as possible so that it can seep down into the soil. And that's the once a year water event. And you can grow a whole crop from that. In a country like Spain, which is what I wrote my first book on, was the palaces of Islamic Spain, we can see water wheels used. These are these great wooden wheels that have cups attached to them. And the water wheel will either be next to a cistern, a well, in which case an animal will turn the water wheel and there is a cog system. Cog system is actually a fairly advanced technology. Yeah, we didn't always have cogs, <laughs> apparently, in history. So I'm a big fan of cog wheels. So the, the cog, by turning one wheel, that wheel will, with its cogs, turn the other wheel, which is then lifting water up bucket by bucket from the cistern down below, pouring it into a ditch, which then runs out into the field where it will be needed. Or if the wheel is positioned next to a river or stream, it doesn't need an animal to drive it, and therefore you have one less cost because animals are very expensive. Instead, the river itself will provide the hydraulic power to turn the wheel such that the, the river is both providing the water and also providing the fuel, so to speak, the power that turns the wheel that lifts the water. So you have both source and movement from source coming from the same technology. So that's a that's a really wonderful one. Also, these water wheels are magnificent when you see them. There are many that still survive. And some of them are huge. Some of them can be three stories high. Most of them are much smaller than that, of course. And then you can also stack the wheels. So you can actually have a wheel that lifts water and it dumps it into a basin and then another wheel that lifts it from that basin and sends it upwards. So you can actually get water lifted, you know, 10 feet, 30 feet, 60 feet, 80 feet up in the air through this technology. And here's the problem. The problem is that the source of water is almost always below ground level. Mm -hmm. It's either down in the aquifer or it's down, you know, at the foot of a mountain in that kind of spongy soil at the foot of a mountain, or it's down in a cistern or it's down in a riverbed. So always you have this problem of how to lift the water up. And the water wheel is definitely the preferred way of doing that. Another one, very simple, is just a lever method where you have a bucket on one end and you have a big rock on the other hand. And then you just have a, a stick in the middle that's the fulcrum. 
and you don't really have to lift the water because the rock on the other end is actually balancing it. But you dip the bucket down, you swivel it, and you dump it into your channel that's going to take it out into the field where it will be used. And apparently, I've never actually seen this, but apparently a really good operator, and these are called shadoofs, but they're levers, basically, a really good operator can produce an awful lot of water that way. They just keep the buckets going, 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 going. So that's another way of lifting water and bringing it out to the field. You know, all of this requires ingenuity. It requires planning. It requires a coordination because you have the source of water over here and the destination of where it's going to be needed over there. You want to have plenty of water. You don't want to have too much water. It's more complicated than it sounds. And I'm fascinated by it. Oh, I think it sounds super fascinating, super complicated. If I had to solve this for myself, it would take me a while, <laughs> right. I think. I wouldn't survive if I had to reinvent the water wheel. I would never get to the cogs. I just know I couldn't get that sophisticated in my thinking with technology. Well, one of the one of the amazing ones, too, when you think about the sheer person power that it takes to actually dig it is ones that go underground, right? And then you have the holes that allow it to be aerated, allow you to go down and do repairs. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And it's quite, it's really all over the Islamic world. It's We think of it as being in greater Iran and Afghanistan, but we also have them in Morocco and North Africa. And apparently there's one or two in Spain, small ones. So the way that works is it's a way of capturing water in the mountains and taking it out into the desert, which will be, you know, let's say eight miles away from the mountain. That's still a long ways to try and bring water. You certainly wouldn't want to carry it bucket by bucket. And the reason why you don't want a surface canal is because the water isn't just flowing off the mountain, it's seeping into the soil of the mountain. So that's one reason why it's very hard to actually capture the water. It's not like there's a lake there that you can draw it from. It's also that in a very, very dry environment, the water will evaporate. You know, by the time it leaves the mountain and arrives at the village where you want to use it, eight miles away, you know, hot sun running through sand, chances are you're going to lose a lot to evaporation. So the technique to handle that is to actually dig down into the soil. So you dig a well at the base of the mountain. And we all know you, you dig a well until you find water, right? And if you're at the base of a mountain, you're going to find water very quickly because it is, I always say it's spongy soil. You have to imagine it's just saturated with all the water that is flowing off the mountain. And even in Iran, we have lots of photos of mountains that are snow-capped, right? Even in, in spring and even into the summer sometimes. So there's this repository of water that is slowly melting and dripping and saturating the ground. So that's where you wanna collect your water down there. But then instead of lifting it up to the surface, with either your lever or your water wheel, and then running it along a surface canal, you run it underneath the ground. So you make an aqueduct, but it's a subterranean aqueduct. And it runs, doesn't run level, obviously, because water always wants to flow downhill, but it runs at a very, very slight decline. Remember, you started at the foot of a mountain and mountains have skirts. So there, it's going to be higher ground than the village where the water is going to end up. So we have this water channel running underground at a slight decline until it reaches eventually the village. It eventually comes out because the land has sloped so much that it actually emerges onto the surface. And at that point, you have literally a stream. I mean, this isn't just bucket by bucket by bucket. This is literally a stream that is spewing tons of water into the landscape. And then you have a different problem, which is you have a lot of water. And you have a lot of land that is dependent on this one source of water. So you have to divide the water up. And there are, across the world, instances where you can see the way water gets divided, where it will actually be run through a kind of comb. And each of the openings in that comb or that filter leads to a mini channel that leads off to one person's farm, the second one leads to another person's farm. The third one leads to another person's farm and so on. And of course, over time, they may buy and sell these water shares. It's like shares in a company such that you might have two of them combined in one very large channel. And you can just sort of almost see the social organization of these farmers writ in the way that water is managed and distributed. And of course, it's a collective enterprise. 
when you have a lever and you lift the water bucket by bucket, that's just me. That's just me and my son doing that as long as it takes. A water wheel is me if I have money and means, but again, it can just be my water wheel. But when you build an underground canal, it is a whole community that gets together to build that canal. So it really does reflect a kind of social organization that is stimulated by the need to obtain, manage, and distribute water. It's fascinating because it is such an essential part. You can't have life without water. Like forget the plants, you can't have human life without water. And so to think about the logistics of it, I think it's absolutely fascinating how this was done over such great distances and over such a wide area of land too. And some of it was already cultivated by the Romans. And so one of the questions that historians have asked is, well, you know, Romans had wheels, they had, you know, levers, they had aqueducts. They didn't, to my knowledge, they didn't use the cannot, but I could be wrong about that. But they certainly had aqueducts. They were great aqueduct builders. They were very good at managing water. They knew how to filter it so that you got all the grit and sediment out before it actually was delivered to the people who were, who were using it. And so one of the questions is, is this, in fact, an innovation that happens in the Islamic period? Or is this simply Islam adopting? Because one of the wonderful things about early Islam is they borrowed from everybody. There were very, there was no religious prohibition against science, against pharmacology, against agriculture, get all the about geometry, the study of the world, the study of astronomy, really no prohibitions against that. So they were able to be very scientific and faithful at the same time. These were not regarded as contradictory. So the question is, well, were they just inheriting from the Romans? And to some degree, that is true. I mean, you know, the wheat, olive, marriage that happens in most of these Mediterranean landscapes, at least the Mediterranean now we're talking about, was certainly something that existed under the Romans, and they did some water management. But what happens under Islam is this, how should I put it, this intensification. And also, I think that because of the way that land was organized, there was a lot of small farms as opposed to huge latifundia, you know, huge sort of villa estates, so that the wealth and the rewards were not concentrated in the hands of a few overlords. You know, today we'd probably say capitalists, but, you know, overlords. Instead, the rewards were reaped by all of the farmers themselves, at, at least to the best that I can, can see. This is what it tells me, that my research. And I, I think that's a, that's a different social model of distributed not wealth necessarily, because I'm not sure they got wildly wealthy, but certainly distributed benefits, which means also you have distributed investments. And when you have lots of people investing, you're going to have more experimentation and more innovation than if you just have one or two. At least that's that's how I'm thinking about it. I, I could change that, but that's how I'm thinking about it according to what I've read and seen and learned. I love that. I love that you, you've you been studying this for so long and you're still open to ideas, still mulling it over. <laughs> well, one of the things that you mentioned in the book that I think you're getting at as well now is the necessity for thinking very deeply about topics that the Islamic world tends to be really known for at this time. Geometry is one of the things I was thinking of that you mentioned in the book as well, because you need to make these aqueducts correct or they're going to fall down and they are, they are what's keeping the people fed and watered in the middle of the desert. Yeah, aqueducts are not for amateurs. That's the byline here. Yeah, aqueducts are complicated because your source of water is in one place and the delivery can be miles and miles away. And it's not like you're going in a straight line from point A to point B. You may have to go around a mountain. You may have to tunnel under a mountain. You may have to go across a valley. So your aqueduct is sort of zigzagging across the landscape. So what this means is you have to be able to read the landscape very, very well. But it also means that somehow, without seeing point A and point B at the same time, you have to be able to calculate a rate of flow that is constant because you don't want to flow too fast. You lose all your water. You don't want to flow too slowly. The, the water will stagnate. It's got to flow steadily at a constant rate, at a constant decline. And how do you do that? If you do that, and then it turns out that you've brought the water to your destination, but now you're 
30 feet below the point where you need the water, you failed in your mission. I don't know how they did it, but it did require some pretty sophisticated geometrical calculations. So that's happening out in the landscape. But at the same time, we also know that there's pretty sophisticated geometrical calculations going on in order to orient the mosques. So here we have an example of the so-called secular, so-called religious, not that they're particularly divided. I don't mean to suggest that. But, you know, one is the world of how do we survive? The other is the world of where do we go after we die? And they're both driven by a need for expertise in geometry. Geometry being a very applied science, right? It's both theoretical, but also very applied. Mm -hmm. And this brings us back to gardens. Let's bring it back to gardens. <laughs> so we've been talking a lot about landscape. Let's bring it back to gardens, which have a lot of geometrical shapes in this. This is just part of culture. It's something that people are thinking about all the time because they need to. What else do we see in gardens? Is it just about the food that you want to eat? What kind of stuff do you find in an Islamic garden in the Middle Ages? So you started talking about geometry, and we find that geometry is a very powerful ornamental device that appears in all of the arts, all of the architecture, and also in gardens. So geometry is there because it's not a garden, for example, that is adorned with statues. I mean, there might be a few, to be quite honest. You know, there were turtle statues, and there were rabbit statues, you know, there were mechanical birds, but not people, generally. Generally, that's still not a hard and fast rule. There was one statue of a woman that we know was in the palace of the caliphs who ruled Cordoba in the 10th century. It was probably a Roman statue, but <laughs> there you go. It was a figural statue. Anyway, so there was geometry. The other thing we might expect to find there, and also remember, we have the celebration of water. So water is has a performance element in that it's not just brought in, it's brought in in a way that draws attention to the act of introducing it. And then the third thing is the plants themselves. The plants would be exotics that were brought from elsewhere and were cultivated. In some cases, they're brought from elsewhere probably because some wealthy person had sent for them, like the caliph. He sent for them or someone has sent him, a, let's say, a gift basket. This, there was actually a case of this where his aunt or his sister sent him a fruit basket from Syria. And the fruit arrives. Of course, it's completely rotten. I mean, you know, it's taken months <laughs> to get there. But they decide to plant the seeds in one of the caliph's gardens and in a matter of years, they have a new variety of, you know, this happens with the pomegranate. We, we know it happens with the fig. It probably happened time and time again. We have a new variety of a known plant, but it's an improved variety, right? It's a better version. So it's a more kind of exotic, more desirable version of that particular fruit. And of course, from the Caliph's Garden, we actually have this in a text that says, from that point on, such and such a fig or such and such a pomegranate was found in all of the gardens of Andalusia, meaning southern Spain. So it, the chronicler even tells us this is the mechanism by which the exotic becomes domesticated. It's brought in deliberately because who doesn't like exotics, right? It's a sign of one's kind of cosmopolitan internationalism, to use modern terms. And then it is on display in the garden. Like, look how special my garden is. I can reach out to Syria and to parts further east to get such wonderful specimens. But then pretty soon, everybody has it. So that's a top down. I was describing water as a kind of bottom up way of thinking about the development of the land. But when it comes to exotic plants, I think we can certainly identify top down models. And probably they coexist with bottom-up models. But we know in the texts, because they describe these instances of the caliph actually sending people, you know, to the east to pick them up some really good stuff. <laughs> well, why not? Why not? Why not? It shows off, as you say. So were gardens just used mostly to show off? Were they used for medicinal purposes? Were they used to garnish the table or all of these things at once? I think all of them at once. There used to be a debate among garden historians, some of whom treated the garden, as I said before, only symbolic, as only a symbol, and only a site of pleasure and aesthetics. But when you look at the kinds of plants that are planted there, it's pretty clear that they're also harvesting the fruit, that these are both productive 
and super aesthetic at the same time. And I'll give you an example that doesn't come from palace culture, but, but mosque culture. And that is the great mosque of Cordoba had a courtyard in which we know because of texts and because of some later images that come from after the period in question, but there doesn't seem to have been a break in the history. Hey, back to what I'm saying. So in the courtyard of the great mosque of Cordoba was planted with fruit trees. We don't know exactly what kind. Today, they're oranges, but the fruit trees, nonetheless. And, you know, there's no reason to have fruit trees at the Mosque of Cordoba. There's just, you don't need them there. But what I think they're there for is to provide a little salary, you know, an extra stipend for the custodian of the mosque so that he would have, you know, a business on the side, if you want. It also produces shade. It also looks beautiful. They also smell beautifully. But I think above all, it was, in fact, we have a text, by the way, we also have a text that says that this is how they were used. And not everyone was on board with that particular example, where they <laughs> not everyone was like, well, we shouldn't have gardens at the mosque because, right. and this is an interesting point, because as we we're talking about earlier, if they are always representing paradise, then it should be the place to have it at a mosque, but people are not always on board where they. <laughs> exactly. So I know what you're alluding to. So Historians have always said, you know, the Islamic garden represents paradise. Well, you would expect the mosque would be a very good place to have an image of paradise, since what you're going in there to pray for is your future in paradise. But at Cordoba, Cordoba is the great example of this. We happen to have a series of, we have one legal case, but the way the legal cases work is they always cite prior legal examples. So you can get a kind of chain that reaches back for centuries sometimes. And that's exactly what happens in this court case where people go to the jurist and ask, you know, is it okay to have fruit trees in the courtyard of the mosque? And the jurist says, no, it's not. It's a distraction and you should chop them down. And he says, and by the way, it's not just me who says this, but also, and he cites a predecessor. And he says, and that guy was citing so-and-so, and that guy was citing so-and-so. And it takes you right back to the moment when the mosque was built. And apparently, Either when it was built or soon after it was built, the orange trees or some form of fruit tree were planted there because we have these legal cases going all the way back. What's interesting is in each of those cases, people were told to chop down the tree. <laughs> so you have two points from that. One is that there's the law and then there's what people actually do. To make that completely clear, there is the speed limit and then there <laughs> is the speed that I drive and they're not exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> so this is well known, right? The prescriptive versus what actually happens. But what's also interesting is that it is showing you that the jurists, and these are not, these are legal scholars whose legal authority comes from their command of religion, their close reading of the Quran, their close reading of the Hadith, which are the sayings and deeds of the prophet that form a model, and their understanding also of, you know, previous precedent. And these people, if anyone would tell us if the garden had a paradisiac resonance for them, and they say the opposite. It's Instead, <laughs> it's the fruit crop. The reason why the trees are there is because of the fruit crop, basically agriculture and not religious symbolism. I think it just goes to show you can never really pull these things completely you cannot. apart. <laughs> you cannot. Also, just people have to eat. They People forget have this to eat. Mm -hmm. because somebody <laughs> they have to pray, has to, but they have to eat. Right, somebody has to maintain the mosque. Someone has right. to keep it clean. That's just exactly. how it is. Exactly. <laughs> now you do say that there is a bit of a shift towards thinking perhaps this is more associated with ideas of paradise when people start to be buried. So they start to have tombs. And I'm wondering as we kind of get to the end of our time, did that change how people built their garden. So did it change what they put in them once people started making them a place of burial? I'm not sure that it changed what went in them. We don't have, you know, we don't have a huge amount of information on actual planting. What we know is what kind of plants were in circulation, were being grown, you know, across the boards, because we have these agricultural manuals that tell us that, but they don't ever say in this garden, we have roses, violets, you know, margaritas. They, they don't say that. I mean, in one or two cases, but not particularly useful. So with the introduction of the tomb, so what happens at a certain point is you have these beautiful gardens 
And then you have a desire for commemoration, which is problematic. In the early years of, of Islam, you, it's quite clear that you're not supposed to be building tombs. You're not supposed to be marking a burial place. People are supposed to be buried, you know, out of doors with nothing marking the tomb. But that just doesn't happen. People want commemoration. And so you have this need for commemoration. And where does it happen? It happens in the garden. That's the moment when suddenly the garden takes on a very clear paradisiac meaning, because you have the deceased who now lives, whose mortal remains, right, whose body lives in the garden and enjoys the garden in some way as a parallel to his or her soul, which presumably enjoys the gardens of paradise. So that's when the garden on earth is absolutely intended to reflect symbolically the gardens of paradise. It's quite clear. That doesn't happen, though, until, I mean, there's no clear moment, but it seems to happen starting in maybe the 11th century, 12th century, fairly late when you consider that, you know, with Islamic architecture, when we think of that the mosque of Cordoba is built in the 8th century, so it's, you know, four or 500 years later that we slowly start to see this new meaning coming to prevail. Because once once you introduce that, then even if it's not a tomb garden, there's still that understanding that paradise is implied so that we have it in palaces, we have it in tombs, we have it all over, all over the world. The garden is understood to be paradise. It's written about in poetry, for example. Mm. I think this just goes to show that we medievalists are always biting off more than we could chew because it is such a huge period, such a long time that we're talking about and such a huge area. So I think we are always taking on more than we can actually deal with. And it shows how things change over time. And so we can never really say this is how it is and it's always this way. It's true. I mean, historians, we always, we have the gift of hindsight, but hindsight can be a thousand years if you're a medievalist. And that's a lot of hindsight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it definitely yeah. is. Well, I want to thank you for coming on and telling us about gardens and landscapes in the Islamic world, because, well, I mean, it is getting dark and cold in our hemisphere where you and I are. Yes, <laughs> so indeed. It's lovely to have this time to actually visualize the amazing things people were able to do with the work of their hands. So thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about this. I would say it's also at a time when we have great anxiety about the health of our environment. It's really nice to look back to a time when, you know, the human environment relationship was productive and not destructive. Absolutely. That, that is definitely something to think of right now. And uh, I'm glad you brought it up. And I hope that other people will look at your book because you have beautiful pictures and examples oh, in it. So thanks so I much. So Thank you, Danielle. I appreciate it. This was great fun. To find out more about Dee Dee's work, you can visit her faculty webpage at arch.illinois.edu slash people slash profiles slash D hyphen Fairchild hyphen Ruggles. Her award-winning book is Islamic Gardens and Landscapes. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, uh, this summer, I happened to be in England. I went to some conferences and such. And one of the places I stopped at was St. Albans Cathedral, which is amazing. And one of the things I really enjoyed about it was this reconstruction of four 13th century wall paintings. They're kind of typical. They you know, get erased during the Re Reformation, get covered over, get kind of discovered, but they're in pretty bad condition. But what they did was took an 18-month project to understand what was originally there. And then what they've done is project that either using light. So it's a, a pretty amazing kind of little thing to see these things come to life. And they have these videos that they show during tours. So I happened to record one and I put that out on social media. And I also wrote an article about what they did and how it kind of transforms and it was pretty cool. So I added that in and that's on the website. Also, we have a couple of really cool pieces. One for the football slash soccer fans, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. the Viking game, ball game that they play. It was called Natikir. And I think that's right. And you of uh, Tarosh has a piece on basically the politics of it and the interesting things about it. So check that out. Plus, Catherine Walton is writing about the life and times of William Caxton. 
Nice. So he, yeah, he's the very first printer in England from like the 15th century. Some of the great works that we look back on are thanks to him. So you can read that and more on the website. That all sounds amazing. Yeah, William Caxton being somebody who not only published stuff, printed it, literally printed it, but also translated and edited. So he's a really interesting guy. But these all sound like amazing articles. So thanks for bringing them to our attention. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to everyone who supports this podcast via Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Patrons can access all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of this podcast. Your support keeps this podcast going, for which you have my eternal gratitude. To become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from gardens to pardons, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening and have yourself a fantastic day. Music